Hi everyone, welcome to the Play by Play podcast. I'm your host DC, and today I'm interviewing Steve Ignorant. How are you doing, Steve? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's an absolute honor. Uh, but uh, uh, the first thing I kind of like to ask is, you know, kind of about the beginning, uh, you know, and kind of the formation of Crass and the feeding of the five thousand, about to reach its forty fifth anniversary. You know, how do you kind of feel about that? Like such an iconic, one of my favorite albums, definitely, and an album that definitely kind of changed my life and got me into like certain things I never thought I'd be getting into uh, about to reach its 45th anniversary. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't know it was the 45th anniversary of it. I can't believe it's been that long. Blimey, it's been my whole life, uh, <laughs> apart from 19 years. Uh, yeah, it's uh, weird. I mean, it's, it's funny to think that way, way back when we recorded that album, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't think it was sell 500. Um, you know, we weren't really interested in it anyway, you know, of, of record sales and stuff. But, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing that, uh, you know, it's it's still going and people are still listening to it. And, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, like, like I'll just like to give a bit of a story. Like, I remember, it was, I'll say it was around three years ago, I was 12 years old. Like, the first Crass song I heard was Batum Hotel, and I heard it in, like, kind of it was a snippet of, like, a Kurt Cobain interview. And I was like, oh, man, this is interesting. And then kind of, like, so I was, it was kind of during the pandemic. I was around 12 years old at the time. I'm 15 now. But, like, um, uh, I, remember, I remember I was chatting to this dude, and he was from the UK. And next to us was, like, a chapel. And at the time, I just felt a bit lonely, like, and I was kind of questioning, you know, my faith and stuff because I came, I come from, like, a Catholic background and stuff. But, like, um, and it was kind of, around the time I was questioning kind of like my faith and stuff and then it was really just when I became an atheist and I remember hearing So What uh, for the first time and uh, Religious Vomit by Dead Kennedys and it really just changed my life like uh, like that especially So What and other songs on that album so thank you so much for like releasing that like because I remember because that's got to be like one of my favorite lyrics ever like um Jesus Christ can save my life, but I can always use my knife. I was like, fuck yeah to this. This is amazing. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> that, that's okay. I mean, it's strange that you uh, were talking about your question in your face because when I wrote that, um, I still, even though I didn't believe in God or anything, you know, I'd given it up. But when I was at school, uh, you know, I, I was planning to become a priest, believe it or not. Um, oh, no way. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Uh, it went through my head uh, for about a, a year. I think I'd started up uh, Christian Union meetings uh, in the school lunch hour. And a few of us used to get together and discuss the Bible. And, uh, oh, that's mad. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But then um, that all sort of disappeared once I discovered girls and alcohol and nicotine. <laughs> and and, and uh, mopeds, uh, but uh, and plus the, uh, the the teacher, religious education teacher we had was a complete dick. Um, I'll tell you what changed it for me was um, um, I was really into it, and I was thinking, yeah, I'll become a priest or something like that. You know, one of those dreams you have as a as a kid. You know, oh yeah, I'll become a missionary and go to go to the Andes, uh, go to the Amazon and save these poor natives and all this sort of thing. Um, and the religious education teacher, uh, who was a Christian, and he said, uh, you know, we'll, you know, we're going to discuss different religions. And I was like, great, because my brother had sort of got started getting me into Buddhism a little bit and uh, reading books and stuff. So this religious education teacher goes, uh, well, you know, uh, it's Buddhism. Buddhists believe that Gautama Buddha lived for seven years on one grain of rice a day, which personally I find hard, very hard to believe. So I put my hand up. Uh, I said, yeah, but sir, you know, if you find that difficult to believe, how about, you know, Lazarus coming back from the dead when, you know, Jesus sort of raised it? And he went, oh, shut up, Ed. And I was like, right. That's it then for me. It's obviously um, – so anyway, going back to so what, when I wrote that, I still had sort of feeling, oh, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't write it because there will be this bolt of lightning that comes down and, you know, I vanish. Um so for me, it was a way of getting all that stuff out. out. So actually, I wrote so what, and nothing happened. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, especially with, like, Ireland and the UK as well, obviously Ireland having a bit more of, like, a Catholic, Roman Catholic population, and then kind of the UK having, like, a big Protestant, Anglican kind of population. Like, it's mad because, like, especially in Ireland, like, there's so much traumatic stuff the Catholic Church and horrific stuff the Catholic Church has done. And, like... 
and just hearing all these stories about all, all these institutions having so much power over you know the government and stuff it's like hor- horrible like especially like the 796 occurrence of uh what happened in Tume in Galway 796 children babies died in uh these kind of nursing homes and they were unreported and all and it was just horrific and it was all controlled by the catholic church so really like and you know i can kind of relate to that too like my two grand aunties are nuns so <laughs> right. like yeah so it was like a great discovery for me and so thank you for that like I, I no, it is, no so. it's no it's interesting to talk about this because uh, it's um you know i don't think people realize how much you know even as a you know i mean i wasn't going to church every week and stuff so i didn't have it as bad as as you or whatever um because i know that the, the protestant faith is very different to the catholic one um but um you know it, i don't think people realize how much of a hold it gets on your life you know the, it, it's in there and to sort of go no i don't believe it i'm not gonna it's almost like you're cutting one of your arms off or something it's it's a very strange thing to sort of actually stand up for yourself and say no i'm not having it i don't you know, believe in it because it's always been there. It's a very, very um, difficult thing to do, actually. Yeah, like I find it difficult to me when I opened up to because I didn't like I didn't open up to my mom. I was an atheist till I say about a year after I'd been an atheist, and then after that, like I pretty much, I'm pretty much so open about it because like I'm kind of in a Catholic school and stuff, and, and you know I have great debates and stuff with like the religious teacher and whatever. But like you know, I think I think as well. Uh, what I was gonna say, like, I think with, ah oh man, I lost my train of yeah. thought. Sorry, I'll come yeah. back to me in a bit. Yeah, but um, but yeah, like it's just mad, like, because like, oh yeah, what I was meant to say was like I was forced to make my confirmation, knowing full well I didn't believe anything the Catholic Church preached or anything they did, and I and I just like I didn't want to be labeled as a Christian. I didn't want to be a Christian for the rest of my life. I was like, no, I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist, and I'm I like to be. I'm proud to be an atheist. Mm. I don't want to associate myself with the Catholic Church, but you know, I find religion fascinating. It's just interesting. Like, but then again, there's so much bad shit that religions have yeah. done. But yeah, but yeah, I'm kind of getting sidetracked on religion a bit. But yeah, that was such a great chat there. Yeah. But that's uh, that's great to that's interesting to hear that you know you wanted to be a priest. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, like uh, that reminds me of someone else. I think I think um, no, it wasn't Henry Rollins, but I know some other. I think it was some other American punk band. One of them was about to become like a part of the Ro- Republican Party or something. But yeah. <laughs> But anyways, another thing I kind of like, uh, I found out something interesting that about the feeding of the 5,000 kind of where it was pressed in the pressing plants wasn't because, you know, with the, with the first pressings, you know, the first track was obviously Asylum yeah. and it got cut out because, you know, it was old grannies in the record factories and they're like, what is this? We don't want to be pressing this. But I heard that one of those factories was either in Dublin or in Belfast. Uh, do you know if that's true or not? Or is that just a rumor? Uh, yeah, I really can't remember. Dublin brings a... Uh... Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, what we call Southern Ireland uh, at the time. Yeah, I think it was probably Dublin. Yeah, Dublin, I, I, yeah. I can't remember that far, but you know. Yeah, because I, t- I got told that by DJ Mal. Shout out to DJ Mal. He covers kind of punk in Ireland and stuff. But he also found out something interesting. I like to chat to you about the Roxy. Yeah. Because <laughs> you recently played, because like, there's always, it's kind of fun seeing these like iconic punk clubs, like, you know, New York had CBGB, and you p- recently played in the 100 Club. <laughs> Um, but like, uh, wasn't the gig that got ba- crass banned at the Roxy? Was that with the, li- uh, was that with the radiators from space? Uh, many people co- consider them the first Irish punk band other than, you know, Paranoid Visions, but Paranoid Visions didn't really come around till 1982. And I think the, uh, I think the radiations from space came around 76 or something. Yeah. I thought, yeah, uh, it, it yeah. was, it was radiations from space. Cause I, I met some, I met a bloke out of radiations from space. But I remember, uh, before the rock, that Roxy gig going out for a, uh, for a cup of tea with him. And, uh, yeah. So it was that, yeah, the infamous one. Yeah. Where we got banned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for being so <laughs> awful. <laughs> I don't blame them actually looking back on it I'm <laughs> how did they respond to Band of the Roxy did they hear it or I, I, they don't, like... I, no, I don't think they even heard it you know it was, um, you know we, the band but it's you know really it's not 
Uh, I mean, obviously, that song isn't just about being bad for the Roxy. It's it's about sort of, you know, it's about all other things as well. But um, no, I don't think they heard it. I just, um, I'm not bumped. I've bumped you know, Apparently, Don Nets was the uh, DJ that night, and um, I said, "Did you ever?" And he went, "No, I don't even remember it, Steve." Tell the truth, I remember some bad could have been you making an awful noise, but uh, that's about. And I went, "Yeah, I can't remember it all ever." So, yeah. Yeah, that that that's funny though. Like, it's just mad. Um, because like I'll be here. I hear all these mad stories of just yeah, crazy gigs and stuff. And some, I mean, like, there's this Japanese noise group called Hernatarash, and they, well, they're like a danger music noise group, and they fucking like they crashed the venue with like a fucking crane, and they got banned from uh performing in Japan for like ten years straight. It's mad, like yeah. Uh, all these stories, but like, yeah, that's that's you know, I love that song, Band Roxy, yeah, well, one of my favorite, yeah. favorites. But uh, kind of, I kind of tied in with a fan question, but I like to chat to you about Punk is Dead, which is actually one of my favorite songs as well. I know I've been saying that, like, literally any song of uh-huh. uh, any song of Yes Sir, I Will, or uh, The Feeling of the Five Thousand would be one of my favorite songs, but I like to chat to you about like Punk is Dead and kind of where you think Punk is now. And then it kind of ties in with the fan question as well. We got in uh, from Mark Cusack, shout out to me. He's a, he's a kind of uh, punk folk punk singer in Limerick where I am, but he, he kind of asked, where do you think Punk is now? And do you ever think there'll be another DIY progressive movement like it? And where do you think it is now? Like, I think partly it depends what sort of punk you mean, really. I mean, you've got your, you know, you've got your commercial punk. Um, that's all over the place. Um, you know, I think I even play punk records on Radio 2 now, which is pretty amazing. But uh, where is it now? I, I don't know. You know, I think it's in people's heads and hearts. Um, and will will there ever be a... I can't imagine there being an, another thing like punk. Not in the same way. Um, I think that if you want to call them movements or whatever... Um, it, it will be a, a different way, you know. Punk was right for that time, you know. I don't think it, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I really don't know, you know. But I know where I yeah. stand on it. You know, I still, I still feel the same, you know, about government and everything, you know, um, and the state of the world. And I think that's where it is. I think, and so, you know, because I'm 65 now, and you know, people, most people I know, they're in their late fifties touching 60 you know we all come from that time you know and, and uh it's you know i don't understand um you know modern music you know like uh what you get in the hit parade or played on radio one you know to me it's just sounds like a car alarm you know um mm. and it's all done and you know there's no don't seem to be any real instruments in there um well i don't understand that you know but it, but then my parents never understand and never understood crass so it, it sort of balances out, do you know what I mean? So, so I'm waiting to see what, what happens. I mean, I think there is a new thing coming along. Certainly it was, I, I think, sort of uh, kick-started by the Sleaford Mods, for example, you know, that sort of ragging thing, and a lot of people have picked up on that. But then before that, there was a band called Streets who were doing the, um, the same sort of thing. So it, it's there, you know, it, it's, you know, I've just got to try and find it. Yeah. Is there any punk bands or artists at the moment you're enjoying? Uh, would there be any artists at the moment, uh, particularly punk, you'll be enjoying? Or Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A band from uh, Belfast called The Hokers. And uh, they're really worth checking. I don't think they've got an album. I, don't, I think they're just about to release an album, um, you know, or, or a CD or something. But um, definitely worth giving a listen to. Um, yeah, there's them, obviously, Paranoid Visions. Um, but there's also a band at the Gimp Fist uh, in England and uh, Dirt, Dirt Box Disco. They're a good fun band. So, yeah, there's a few around that I listen to. Cockney Rejects, of course. Mm. Yeah, like it's always interesting hearing Belfast punk bands because obviously Belfast had a really interesting punk scene, especially in the 70s. That, like, I'll say not really the hide out the troubles, but like you know, hearing about Good Vibrations records and, you know, some of it was like, you know, a bit power pop-ish. I wouldn't really consider it some of it punk, but like, but like bands like Stiff Little Fingers mm. or Rudy even, like, I don't think Rudy get enough credit. I think Rudy are pretty great. Mm. And, you know, especially the work of Terry Hooley as well. Like he was such, you know, a predominant figure in that scene. Yeah. I guess you could call him like the John Peel of Belfast punk. If he would. Yeah. Yeah. But like, um, but yeah, I mean, 
But what are your opinion like kind of going back because you were saying, you know, you were kind of feeling the same about the British government. Like, what do you think of it now compared to obviously you were crass were kind of in the Thatcher Reagan era. But like, what do you think of the new kind of British government now with the whole like Liz Truss thing and the Rushy Sanic coming in nearly over the end of last year? Like, what do you think of that now? Kind of England becoming a bit of like a Tory place like it always has been for the last, you know, 40 ish years now. Well, I just think England's the laughing stock of the world at the moment. I mean, you know, this, you know, how can they dare call themselves a government? You know, they could organise a piss up in a in a fucking brewery. You know, I mean, it's just amazing. You got, a, you know, a, we've just had uh, Boris Johnson, who lied uh, about being at a party during lockdown. Um, he's, you know, he got rid of uh, his aide or whatever it was, uh, Dominic Cummings, who was caught on a train with the virus or something, but he was going somewhere. Um, you've got um, uh, Rishi Sunak, who was fined uh, 50 pounds. Good luck, you know, for breaking the rules of, of lockdown. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, you've got Liz Truss, who was Prime Minister for, what, seven weeks or something stupid? 44 days. Well, there yeah, you go. And she, and she stands to, she's getting a bodyguard for security for life. Um, and she gets a huge bloody payout for it. And what did she say? Well, at least I've been prime minister. Right, thanks, Liz. So that's, you know, plus she almost ruined uh, the economy of this country. But, you know, what what are they doing? You know, are they helping poor people? No. You know, have we still got have we still got food kitchens? Yes. Have we still got homeless people? Yes. Have we still got a racist problem? Yes. Uh, have we still got child exploiter? Yes. So basically, it's like reading Charles Dickens, isn't it? Yes. And nothing's changed. And this is the year 2023 and it's still the bloody same. So they're absolutely fucking useless. Yeah. Same but in I Ireland as well. Like, because now we got it. Like, we just recently got a coalition that no one fucking asked for. Like, it was like they didn't publicly vote or anything because, like, like we Ireland has been like under rule for Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil for the last hundred years, and they haven't done shit. Like, yeah. like there's there's a like I was at I was at a HSC protest the other day, yesterday actually. Uh, the HSC would be kind of the Irish equivalent of the NHS, but like even there's people like without hospital beds and then dying on hospital beds. Like I was chatting to families and they're having like people people in their like twenties dying in hospital yeah. beds because the lack of support going to. Uh, you know the HSC or anything is fucking horrible. Yeah, we're just in a shit state, and even what's going on in America at the moment, like America's been fucked ever since it was founded. Yeah, and you could say the same with the UK as well. Like, yeah, no, shit hasn't been done. Yeah, I mean, you know, the fact that, 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 that um, you know, oh, you know, every, every Thursday, everyone go out on your doorstep and, and clap for the NHS. Yeah, all right, you know, show your support and all this. Um, yeah. The government said to the, um, are they even talking to the to the people of the NHS because they want a bit more money to live on? No, not so. Oh no, no, they're just uh, they're endangering people because they're going on strike. For fuck's sake, you know, it, it's just it's just ridiculous, you know. So. Yeah. Like, and I think it's such a shame now because it's getting worrying because, like, it's business people becoming politicians. What is it? Like, I'm pretty sure 60% of the people in Dáil Éireann, which would be, like, the House of Commons of of Ireland, 60% of them are landlords. Yeah. Like, it's, it's fucking landlords. What a surprise. It's not surprising oh, yeah. at all. Like, it's just mad. And then, like, especially, like, Rushi Sanek's a fucking billionaire. He's yeah. a businessman. Mm. He's, he's not a prime minister. Like, yeah. I don't, I think they need to get rid of um, having landlords and business people uh, as fucking politicians because they're, they're just running it like companies, corporations. Like, Abs- the government is just becoming absolutely. corporations now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's just a shame. And it, it's sad to see now like like you know you can now you can't even buy a house in ireland it's getting that bad like and like uh leo vracker who is the taoiseach with the prime minister of ireland like ireland has a massive direct provision problem which is kind of like refugees coming in like we're taking in a lot of ukrainian refugees at the moment but direct provision is really just a racist system that really puts you know people from afghanistan parts of africa into these kind of camps and giving them like i think it's 18 euro per week uh, for food and shelter and it's just horrible mm. and like and Leo Vracker came out and said oh, at least they're not l- sleeping on the street just a fucking dickhead like, yeah. and he's running the country it's just a shame yep. but yeah 
well change it up a tiny bit like and kind of back back to it as well like i like to chat about the thatcher gate tapes a tiny bit <laughs> and like and that's like a mad story because where did the ca is it true that the cia like ran an investigation and tell you with the kgb or something yes yeah and mi5 were on their files as well uh it was a it was a huge uh thing. i mean we it's an old cliche that i keep using but really we only did it for a laugh you know we didn't think anybody would take it seriously i mean if you listen to it it's so badly done you know it's got to be a joke and if they had half the brains they should have the people investigating it would have realized that all that, that those conversations were bits of um recordings taken from interviews off of the radio from um thatcher and reagan separate ones we just literally cut up the tape with a razor blade and stuck it together and put the sound of the telephone ringing um and send it off um i mean if we were to do that uh these days you'd, you'd put, we'd probably be in prison for uh you know um you know incitement to uh what's it bloody called uh terrorism or something you know um but yeah it was absolutely bad uh, uh the way they you know i mean yeah and then when I found out, it was just a punk band called Crass doing it for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what fools they looked, you know? I mean, that's stupid, can you be? <laughs> yeah, but but didn't the KGB approach you and ask the members of Crass to be involved with the KGB? Did they approach you and ask to join? Or Because I know it was mentioned in that there's an authority about yourself, the documentary that came out. I say, I say it's nearly turning 20 years old at this point, but yeah, I know Penny mentioned it in the documentary. Well, no, I don't remember being uh, invited by the KGB to, um, no, I, I remember uh, we, no, I remember we had to do uh, an interview at a hotel in London, uh, and in one room was the American um, journalists, and in another room down the hall was the Russian journalists, um, and we had to walk from one room to the other to answer questions, um, and uh, I didn't mind because the Russians had vodka with them, of course. Uh, but um, after a few vodkas, we said, look, this is stupid. What matters? Well, why don't we all sit in the same room? So we did. And uh, then the Americans and the Russians started talking with each other. And I just went down the pub in the end. It was like, different to it. But no, I don't remember being, um, I don't remember being uh, chaperoned by the KGB at all. No, oh, no. okay. All right. So that was about, sorry, I, I, I got a bit mixed up there. But yeah, like, yeah, that's crazy though. I mean, like Dead Kennedys, I think they did kind of a similar thing with a song called "Kinky Sex Makes the World Go Round," but they didn't go to court because of that. They uh, it was Jello by Afra who went to court because they they put like a H.R. Giger poster of like a bunch of dicks and vaginas going into each other. Yeah, and he got like sued for that, and and like they questioned about lyrics and stuff, and it's just mad. Like all these court cases and shit going around about just about a laugh. Like it's just mad. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you remember that cool case with the, uh, what heavy metal band was it? Was it Judas Priest? Or, I really can't remember. Uh, no, Judas Priest got brand to court because uh, the parents thought they were responsible for their son's suicide. That's right. When, they shot himself yeah. in the face or something. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Because they, he played their records backwards. And um, yeah, yeah, he played their records back and it sounded like uh, kill yourself, kill yourself or something. So they go to court and all, and it's like, what the fuck, you know? You know yeah, absolutely mad. So that's sort of, you know, there's a lot of nutters out there, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Cannibal Corp, the same thing happens to them. They got banned from countries. Like, I think they were banned from Australia and New Zealand for a while or something. Yeah. Just all these mad cases. Like, even, even, because you had those groups in the 80s, like, in America, had the PMRC, who was, found, like, founded by Tipper Gore, who was married to yeah. Al Gore, who was the yeah. fucking Senate at the time. Yeah. And like they brought, um, wasn't it like, I'm not even a fan of Led Zeppelin anymore, but they brought in, didn't they bring in like Jimmy Page? Cause if you played Stairway to ha Heaven backwards, it was like, I love Satan or something, <laughs> something crazy like that. If you played Stairway to Heaven backwards, they say, I love Satan or some, something ridiculous. Well, like I'll that. give you an interesting thing about Stairway to Heaven because I'm very proud, um, to be able to say that I've never heard Stairway to Heaven. Uh, you're you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I'm determined. <laughs> yeah. I'm determined never to hear it. I mean, I've heard a little bit of it, um, but I'm like, no, I don't hear it. Um, so, I, and I um, and I can't play "Smoke on the Water." 
<laughs> yeah, uh, uh, like I, 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 I play bass. I mainly play drums, but I do music production as well. But I've been playing bass for around a few weeks now, a few months now. Um, but like, I, like I think I, I used to play guitar. I took like two guitar lessons before I switched to drums. And yeah, "Smoke on the Water" is like the only song I know how to play on guitar. It's like zero three five or something, yeah. something, something ridiculously easy like that. But yeah, yeah. but um. But yeah, like one thing I'd like to ask as well, um, you know, kind of, especially like even you can say an album like Station of Crass, or, but mainly Yes Sir I Will. How did you kind of get into more like kind of noise and experimental music? Because, you know, like most most of those, especially Yes Sir I Will is quite a noisy, noise punk kind of noise rock album, a bit of an experimental album. How did you get more into that kind of style of music? Um, well, really, I think it was Penny Rambo. Um, you know, that, that was his influence. I mean, he, he, it, we took, uh, oh my God, uh, it was uh, Christ the Album. And we took about six months to do that. You know, that was going to be our sort of super duper, you know, um, brilliant um, record. And by the time we'd finished it, the Fortland's Ward started. <laughs> and Penny Rambo said, well, you know, shit, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't mentioned the Fortland's War, you know, which was crass not to mention the Fortland's War, you know. So he went off and wrote the entire thing um, and uh, came back and just went in the studio about two weeks later, I think. But it was, that, and that's why it's like really free form. And, and apart from that bit where I was singing it, um, you know, actually sing that song if there was no government and there it goes. Um, and that's really what it was. But uh, I mean, I didn't like it. We performed, we actually performed it live in Iceland. Uh, Penny and Rambo wasn't there. He had an ear infection. Um, but I absolutely hated doing it because it was, you had to stand, I had to stand there with the lyric sheets, reading from a bit of paper. I didn't know how to stand. I didn't know where to put myself. So I said, I'm never doing that live again. And I never did. Yeah. So, oh, damn. Uh, but yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm actually have the, I actually have the crass biography with me, and I've actually have a photo of you. I don't know if you can see, yeah, it. I don't yeah. think the audience can see it, but that's a photo of you backstage in Iceland. Yeah, yeah. that was a bit, that was a bit mad because you, you had fans in Iceland. Crass had fans in Iceland. It's like mad to think that you know, kind of crass spread throughout most of the world. Like, yeah, well, that's the thing because we didn't, you know, we didn't realize, uh, you know, and it really wasn't until the start of computers and you know the internet and all this business, social media. I think it's called. <laughs> um, it wasn't until that that I realised, suddenly realised how global, you know, Crass had been um, and is, you know, that, and that was a real surprise to me because I, I just didn't realise that. I just didn't know that at all. I don't think any of us did. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's a bit mad, like, uh, seeing all these fans and stuff, especially, especially with Crass because you were quite, like, a local band but yeah like uh someone asked um someone asked about your early contributions to the current 93 work yeah and how did that come about uh well i was um, i knew uh, david tibet because uh, he was uh, living in the same place as uh, some friends of mine um down there in south london and uh we started hanging out together uh me and uh, me and tibet and um and then he, he said, oh, you know, you, would you do some vocals for me? I went, yeah. So I did some vocals, uh, did some, wrote some lyrics, uh, Falling Back in Fields of Rape, I think it was called. Um, yeah, did a couple of tracks with him, did a couple of gigs with him, and, and then realised it wasn't for me. So, you know, I packed it in. Mm. But that's, that's, and is that... Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but was that when you kind of conflict came about? It was, or was it a bit after? It was, it was round about the same time. I think I was dabbling in conflict as well at the time, you know, so, uh, yeah. But, um, so around like 1981 ish, uh, uh hang on. No, uh, be, no, that'd be, uh, cause crash didn't finish till 1984. So that would have been 1980, yeah. 1986, 87, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. But like conflict is great as well. I I think I don't, I think many people forget that that you were in conflict for a while. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, I'll try anything once. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, well, that's really it. Like we got a few fan questions in. Um, but yeah, so uh, Charlie likes to ask, you know, what's your favorite song that you have written? That I've written. Yeah. Or, I mean, it's or be, made. Uh, or, I think it's got to be uh, I Was Still Living. Yeah. 
It's got to be. It's the first proper one I ever wrote, and it still says it still does what it says on the tin. So you mm. know, yeah, it's got to be that one. Yeah, one of my favorite craft tunes as well, and songs of all time. But uh, but also uh, a kind of interesting story with this last one. Um, so this comes in from Sarah Jane Hopkins, uh, aka Baby Nids, and they actually told me they met you in a pub in Dundalk once. Uh, I said this was a couple of years ago now. Mm-hmm. But uh, they like to ask, what do you think is the best way to protest, or do you have any new ideas to for protesting today? No, uh, I've got no ideas for protesting today. Um... No, I, I can't answer that one. Um, you, I think as an individual, you do what you think is is right. Um, whatever way you think is best to protest is is your way of protesting. Um, you know, depending on what way you do that, you know, if you use violence or whatever, be prepared to be arrested and, and banged up. Um, you know, I can't speak for other people in that way. Yeah. But yeah, Steve, that's all really I got to say. Thank you so much for coming on. Is there any gigs or anything you like to plug or anything? Uh, no, because we played in um, um, we played in England. Um, so yeah, oh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, really, thanks so much, Steve, for coming on. I really appreciate it. It was great chatting to you, and I uh, wish you the best as well. Uh, can't wait to see what else you have lined up as well. Okay, it's brilliant. And just for but just mm-hmm. for a go, I'd like to plug the Hokers again um, from uh, uh, Belfast. I think that'd be a very interesting bunch uh, to interview on your radio show. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Well, I also I also have a podcast as well. So um, right. but yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Steve.